All right, good morning. Well, we are now uh, going to be discussing Act 1 of Romeo and Juliet, Act 1, Scene 1. We'll, uh, we'll go from there and see how far we get. Um, most people understand um, something, they've heard something about Romeo and Juliet over the years. Um, and Shakespeare includes in his prologue um, enough information so you know what's going on. And really, there's actually also some spoilers uh, that people get upset about, but he tells you what's going to happen. He doesn't tell you how it's going to happen. I don't think it affects um, your caring about the characters, your anxiety about what's happening to the characters, even though you know what's going to happen to some of them. You don't know how it's going to happen. And it's the anticipation, I think, that, that, that works here. So let's start with the prologue. Um, it's set for a chorus. Sometimes it would have several people, several of the actors come out and read this. Sometimes it would just be one actor that just drives out on stage and read, read this out um, to the audience. Two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona where we lay our scene. From ancient grudge break a new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life, whose misadventured piteous overthrows doth with their death bury their parents' strife. The fearful passage of their death marked love, and the continuance of their parents' rage, which, but their children's end naught could remove, is now the two hours' traffic of our stage, to which if you with patient ears attend, what you shall miss, our toil shall strive to mend. All right, so pretty much, you wanted to lay out, there's, uh, there's, there's two audiences. If you look at the Globe Theater, if you look at that diagram at some point, there are two audiences here. You have everyone up in the stands who are wealthy, either wealthy merchants or nobility. They're able to pay the higher price for the seats that are underneath um, the roof. So if it starts raining, they're going to be okay. Everyone else is in the pit. Uh, and the pit was just as it is now. It's, it's a lively place to be. Um, but it was not necessarily always an expensive place. I think you pay a bit more to, for, for front row seats or to sit in the pit um, or to stand in the pit now. Uh, but back then, not so much. Um, so people would pay a penny, very little money to get in. Um, there would be, as there is now, a lot of drinking going on in the pit, a lot of eating, and because they wouldn't want to lose their spot, a lot of urination in the pit. All right, everyone's sweaty, no one's leaving, they don't want to go anywhere, they want to see the play, so it's a pretty smelly place. It's also where, again, all the poor people are going to be, and more than likely the uneducated people are going to be. So Shakespeare is doing this for, for them to just grasp everything that's going on, and for the audience as well. It's, it's just backstory, all right? So where it's taking place, we've got the setting, Verona, Italy, all right? We've got two families. We don't know why they're mad at each other, but they've got an ancient grudge that started for some reason decades ago and it's still going on now, all right? Um, it's, it's an ancient grudge, and again, it breaks a new mutiny. So we have, this is just, we're gonna have a, a, another brawl here shortly between two of them, uh, the two families, um, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. And this is where Shakespeare, this is, it is, I don't know, it's, I find it really fun. Shakespeare plays with language a lot, all right? Civil. So if you want to take some notes at this point, um, where you, is what you were doing in class, if you have a piece of paper handy to a few, or everyone else out there in the cyber world, um, civil blood, civil. Um, to the, the, what does the, the word civil mean? This is where you two chime in because no one else is going to answer me. They came like the same thing. All right, so like the civil war. All right. What, sorry, Dave, what? They're fighting. They're fighting like Yes. All right. So they, 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 are, they are also, I mean, they're civil people. To be civil, what does it mean to be civil to each other? Like, like nice. Yeah, to be nice. All right. So they're supposed to be nice. That word civil. All right. They're also of the same, not necessarily fam family, but they're of the same country. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and they're also supposed to be civil, if you take that as a base and you expand it out, civilized. All right, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. Um, there's a bit of irony there. Um, the, some of the, one of the terms we're looking at is verbal irony, where they say one thing and mean another. Mm -hmm. Shakespeare does a lot with that. We'll be getting into some puns and double entendres here shortly. All right. Um, all right. So 
Now, it says a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life. So we know that there is going to be one member of each family who are going to fall in love. They're star-crossed lovers. In other words, they're falling in love, but this isn't meant to be. This is just fate is not with these two. All right? Bad things are going to happen. It's a tragedy. All right? A tragedy is when the main character or characters experience a, either a downfall in fortunes or they die by the end. In this case, both. All right? Um, so we know that's going to happen. The two main characters are going to die. Everyone already probably knows that they walk into Romeo and Juliet. He's telling the characters or the, 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 the audience right now that's what's going to happen. And he said, whose piteous, misadventure piteous overthrows doth with their death bury their parents' strife. That finally, the death of these two is what brings their parents to peace. All right? The fearful passage of their death marked love. So, how they wooed each other. And the continuance of their parents' rage, which but their children's end not could remove, is now the two hours traffic of our stage. So pretty much for the next two hours, if you were there watching it live, um, this is what's going to happen on the stage. This is the traffic on the stage. We're going to tell you these things. And he's saying, if you missed this, so if <laughs> the witch, if you with patient ears attend, what here shall miss, our toil shall strive to bend. So if you missed anything he just told you, hopefully their work as actors will make it all clear to you shortly. All right? Okay, so we're going to start off. Um, the nice thing about... Uh, watching this as a play, most of the versions that are done, um, they have the Capulets and the Montagues, as they would have been in the time, wearing different colored clothes. So you could tell one family from another. It's like, you know, school colors. All right, you can always tell, oh, there's a Spartan. There's a Cardinal. You know, whatever. Pardon? Are family members wanting to join in? I heard voices in the background. I didn't know whether anyone else wanted to join in and play parts. No? No, they're not going to. No. All right. Okay, so, enter Samson and Gregory. They're the house of Capulets. All right. Gregory, on my word, will not carry coals. No, for then we should be colliers. I mean, we be in collar, we'll draw. I, while you live, draw your neck out of collar. I try quickly being moved. But thou art not quickly moved to strike. A dog of the house of Montague moves me. To move is to stir, and to be valiant is to stand. Therefore, if thou art moved, thou runnest away. A dog of that house shall move me to stand. I will take the wall of any manner made of Montague's. And that shows thee a weak slave, for the weakest goes to the wall. Tis true, and therefore women being the weaker vessels are ever thrust at the wall. Therefore, I will push Montague's men from the wall, and thrust his maids to the wall. The quarrels between us, our masters, and uh, our masters and us, their men. Is all one. I will show myself a tyrant. When I have fought with the men, I will be civil with the maids. I will cut off their heads. The heads of the maids? Aye, the heads of the maids are their maiden heads. Take it what sense thou wilt. Thou must take it in the sense they feel it. Me they shall feel why I am able to stand, and tis known I am a pretty piece of flesh. Tis well thou art not fish. If thou hast, thou hast been poor John. Draw thy tool. Here comes the house of Montagues. All right, so what the heck was all that? All right. Shakespeare used a lot of wit, all right? Wit is just fun wordplay, all right? And Shakespeare is well known for this. Um, the play is a tragedy. You read, the, there was a bit of uh, the introduction you read earlier, I think. If not, maybe I didn't read it to you. Um, but anyway, um, what he achieved here is to create a tragedy, but yet a comedy as well, all right? We're going to laugh along with the characters. Um, you might cry. I don't know. Depends on how powerful the words are. All right, but it starts off light, all right? Um, again, Shakespeare's got two audiences. He's got the people in the pit who want some coarse, fun humor, all right? And he's got to throw in some things with them. And then he needs some more sophisticated things for people in the stands. Now, the people in the stands are going to get the jokes. They're just not necessarily able to laugh at them because of propriety. They have to just go, hee, 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 you know. Or they play dumb like you do. Um, when things happen in movies and your parents look at you as if, did you get it? And you're like, what? I don't know what's going on. And you're laughing to yourself. All right. Or you get it for popcorn during those awkward scenes. All right. Um, all right. So what's going on here first is we have puns. Have you heard of puns before? Puns are pretty much dad jokes. All right. Uh, it's play on words where you're playing with the language, um, how words sound, the means of words and how they look, all right? So we've got 
a few things going on here throughout. Um, they start off with will not carry coals. All right. Uh, Gregor will not carry coals. To carry coals, and this you might want to write down, like put pun down, which is a play on words, and then below that, coals um, to start off with. All right. So will not carry coals. I've got these wonderful handy dandy little things called footnotes at the bottom of my page that explain all this stuff to you. Most of the text that you have, you have some of the explanations, but not all of them, because they don't want you to know some stuff. All right. Um, so to carry coals is will not suffer humiliation, as in to carry hot coals would be to be humiliated because you're burned. The language hasn't changed that much. All right. Um, but also then to carry coals is to be a coal merchant. You're carrying coal. All right. Because the next line that uh, Gregory comes back with is, no, for then we should be colliers who are coal merchants. All right, so Gregory's trying to be funny. Sans is like, well, ha, 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 that was great, all right? And a lot of times, I mean, Shakespeare's audience would get this. Most modern productions cut this part out um, because people don't get that part of it anymore, and even some of the other ones, some of the other jokes they cut out. But I don't think they should. I think they need to leave them all in. All right. Uh, and then the next line from Samson, I mean, we be in collar, we'll draw. So we've got coals, colliers, which sounds a little bit like collar, all right? But collar, C-H-O-L-E-R, sounds like collar, which I don't have one. I should have, I, next time I'll wear a suit coat, I'm sorry. Um, sounds like collar, but C-H-O-L-E-R is anger. All right, so if we're insulted, we'll be angry. We've got coals, collier, collar. And then Gregory comes back, I, while you live, draw your neck out of collar, which is a noose, all right? Because if you're going to fight in public, what's going to happen to you? You're probably going to get killed or punished. Well, yeah, you're going to get arrested now. Back then, you could get killed because, it, you know, we're fighting with swords here. Also, um... This has happened, a bunch of these fights have happened and the prince is very happy. All right, we'll get to that in a little bit. All right. Um, and then Samson says, I strike quickly being moved. So moved as in emotionally moved by someone because they've angered you, so I'm going to hit them because I'm angry. And Gregory says, but thou art not quickly moved to strike. All right, you might be emotionally moved, but you're not really going to physically attack them because you're a coward, you know, you're, you know, whatever. And then Samson says, the dog of the house of Montague moves me, all right, calling the Montagues dogs, you know, they move me. They upset me because I just don't like the look of them. And then Gregory comes back with, to move is to stir and to be valiant is to stand. Therefore, if thou art moved, thou runnest away, you know. So really, if you're, if you're brave, you're, not gonna, you're just going to stand there, and you're just probably going to start the fight. You're not going to dance around. All right, this isn't a high school fight here. Like, I'll be back. I'll be back. No, it doesn't matter. All right. So Samson then says, a dog of that house shall move me to stand and I will take the wall of any manner made of Montague's. All right. So, so this phrase, take the wall. All right. We're moving away. We're done with the call and the colliers and the move jokes. Um, and now we're doing something else here. To take the wall um, is a reference to more how houses were built, well, even in, even in Italy. Um, but let's go back to England because Shakespeare's living there. Um, what happens is, and I, I, I usually have a board, I need a chalkboard or a whiteboard, dang. Um, all right, <clears throat> you've seen pictures of England and old streets where the houses come up and they cantilever out and then they come up again. All right, the reason they did that is because you had to, your original taxes were based upon the footprint of your house. So you would build a house with a small footprint, and the next story you would build a little bigger, cantilevered out, the next story a little bigger, all right? Um, the streets then became a bit dark because, I mean, even I've, there's an old, uh, some towns in England, I can't remember which one, where the houses have almost leaned in and are touching <laughs> because they're so old, all right? Um, but if you look down at the street, what this does is, Several things. Um, the streets are cobbled with stone, right? Um, and there isn't necessarily what we consider a sanitary sewer system, all right, or even a, a, a water catchment system. Um, the rain comes down, and usually there's a bit of a, a swale in the middle of the road where the water, when it's raining, will all flow out. So where do you want to stand? In the middle. 
no, no, no. Where do you want to stand so you don't get wet? Under the houses. Yeah, under the houses, on the sides, or you're against the walls. Also, because there's no indoor plumbing and there's no toilets, they had chamber pots, and you'd also have bowls of kitchen scraps and dirty water, and you would simply chuck that out your window. All right? So if you don't want to get hit with the chamber pots from the bedrooms upstairs as they're thrown out the window with all the urine feces in them, you stand at the wall. So to take the wall means I'm going to stand against the wall here where is the better, better place to be, and anyone else is going to have to walk in the middle. All right. So I will take the wall of any man or man of Montague. But Gregory says that shows the weak sleeper, the weakness goes to the wall. All right. Um, the weakest one is always pushed aside, even though really it would be in the middle. All right. So we're dealing with a pun here of what it means to go to the wall. But then Samson said, "'Tis all one. I will show myself." The, oh, sorry. No, the quarrel is between us, our masters, and us, their men. All right. Um, oh, sorry. I missed the line. Back, sorry. Back one. What happened? <clears throat> Samson says, "'Tis true." And therefore, women being the weaker vessels are ever thrust to the wall. I mean, like women would have been pushed aside. All right, that's true. All right, Shakespeare has to deal with um, censors, like we have to today. I mean, you have to, you can't just say anything on TV or anything in the movies. You're going to be rated. The censors are going to say, "Oh no, we can't do that here. You can't. You know, you're going to have to. That's going to happen to have an X rating. Have to have an R rating. Then no one's going to come and watch your film because nobody wants to watch R rated film." All right. Um, but Shakespeare wants to get around the censors, the critics. He wants to make sure that he can say what he can say, but get away with it. We all want to do that, right? So what he uses um, are double entendres, all right? A double entendre is a pun, but a pun isn't always a double entendre. Double entendre, either of you in French? No. Okay, all right. Entendre means to intend. Um, you intend two things. There's two things that are intended by the phrase. All right. So that is, in, in essence, what a pun is. You intend two different things by it. All right. Um, but the double entendre, that, that second meaning is usually sexual in nature. All right. So it's a dirty joke. Okay. And this is for all the people in the pit. They're going, oh, yeah, that's great. All right. So I'm sure you can figure out what thrust to the wall means. Yes. Okay. All right. Good. All right. If you can't ask your parents later after, after the Zoom meeting is over. All right. <clears throat> um, don't ask. Them. All right. Um, so he says, I will be in the weaker vessels that are ever thrust to the wall. Therefore, I will push Montague's men from the wall and thrust his maids to the wall. So he's going to push Montague's men into the gutter in the middle of the road and he's going to thrust the women to the wall. All right. Gregory says, the quarrel is between our masters and us, their men. And Samson says, tis all one. I will show myself a tyrant. When I have fought with the men, I will be civil with the maids. I will cut their heads off. How is cutting their heads off civil? That doesn't sound civil to me. doesn't sound nice. So guess what? Something else is going on here. There's a double entendre. Hmm? Yeah, you'll get some popcorn if it's just getting awkward. <laughs> um, all right, so... Um, Gregory says, the heads of the maids? And Samson says, I the heads of the maids or their maidenhead, take it in what sense thou wilt. All right, so what is a maidenhead? This is where, this is where the joke comes from. And most people... Is a virgin? Yes, their virginity. All right, so he will take their virginity. He's being civil. He's being nice to them. Uh, you know. All right, anyway, this is before the Me Too movement, so, you know. They would be in trouble now, which they should be, by the way, all right? Okay, so, and he said, take it in what sense thou wilt. So, like, this is where Shakespeare's sort of getting away with getting around the critics and, and, and the censors, um, because they could, I mean, they could shut playhouses down if they feel that things are too inappropriate, all right? Because they already thought they were a, they were a hotbed of sin. Um, there, was, there were always protesters outside the playhouse, um, and there was usually some priest out there, or some religious zealot, who was claiming that to do things on stage, remember we talked about the mystery plays? If you listen, well, I did. If you listen to the, the Shakespeare background video that I did, 
I talk about the mystery plays, um, <clears throat> which again are usually religious in nature. They're, they're, they're playing out the passion of Christ. They're playing out saints' lives. Um, but after a while, people were upset and they thought that this was not real. This was just show. Um, the same the same Protestants who felt that um, icons were, were not appropriate, crosses and statues, or, or, you know, things that were just too decorative and not really what it should be. Um, they didn't like that. So that actor, actors and acting was considered lying because you're not really being true to yourself. All right. So there was some religious people being upset outside. There's people were being too moral, people mainly who are just too, too worried about other things. Just have some fun. All right, so back to this. Take it what sense thou wilt means you, know, you can take it in whatever. If you, I didn't mean it that way. I'm not sure how you're taking it, you know. And then he gets away with it. All right, Gregory says they must take it in the sense that they feel it through sensation. All right, you're getting those jokes. All right, moving on. Um, and then Gregory says they must make, take it in the sense they feel it. Um, they, me, they shall take while I am, me, I shall feel while I am able to stand because no, I am a pretty piece of flesh. So he's saying I'm, he's saying he's very attractive and they will be glad for his civilness. All right. And he takes their virginity. All right. But I don't know. Caleb, I think you know how guys talk to each other. All right. They're usually bragging about things that aren't true. Yeah. Right? They usually, usually insult your friends in nice, gentle ways. So Samson thinks he's, you know, a pretty piece of flesh. And Gregory comes back, well, thou, tis well thou art not fish. If thou hast, thou hast been poor John. So it's a good thing you're not a fish, because if you were, you would be poor John. Poor John, you don't even have a footnote for this in your books, is dried, salted hake. All right? So it's dried, shriveled fish. I think you can get the joke and what he, how he's trying to insult his friend, all right? Um, now, their banter, their wit, all this is just sort of like to, to break things up and to get the audience warmed up and laughing a little bit, you know, get them into the situation, all right? And then the stage direction, in walks Abraham, another serving man of the Montagues, draw thy tool, here comes the house of the Montagues, all right? Draw thy tool, as in take out what? Here comes the Montagues. What should he take out? Sword. His sword, but the word tool. Makes it sound like not violent. No. Um, it, 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 well, hold on. Let's, let's do the next line because I think it'll be obvious what he means by tool. But again, it's double entendre. It could mean two things. Draw thy tool. Samson says, my naked weapon is out. Coral, I will back thee. Naked weapon as the sword is not in the sheath anymore. So it's naked, but also it's naked weapon. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Thank you for the cringe there. You should have cringed. Yes. All right. Okay. And, and, a, lot, and a lot of times, like, you know, the guys in the audience would have laughed at her briefly, and the ladies would have either giggled to themselves or looked like they were a little offended because they didn't want to be thought to get the joke. All right. Okay. So how? Turn thy back and run. Fear not. No, Mary, I fear thee. Let us take, let us take the law of our side. Let them begin, okay, because, you know, whoever starts the fight is the one who gets in trouble, except in school where it doesn't matter what happens, you're in trouble, all right? I will frown as I pass by and let them take it as they list. So this is, this, this is a high school brawl. I'm going to bump him in the hallway and see if he gets mad, all right? And if he does, we'll fight. If not, we'll let it go, all right? Nay, as they dare, I will bite my thumb at them, which is a disgrace to them if they bear it. So it bites it, yeah. To bite your thumb tone like that is to, you know, give them, put them the middle finger pretty much back then, all right? So they're going to bite their thumb in. Abram, do you bite your thumb at us, sir? I do bite my thumb, sir. Do you bite your thumb at us, sir? Is the law on our side if I say A? All right, so what's going on there? When he says, is the law on our side if I say A, what is it? Does it do you have something in your text that tells you how he's saying that? Aside to Gregory. Aside. What's an aside? This is like, important. Like he took him aside and like said it quietly. Yes, yeah, pretty much. I mean, he didn't necessarily. Sometimes they are taking him aside. Sometimes it is just an aside. All right, and on stage things are artificial. Um, I mean, if he said that and the audience can hear him, obviously the other characters on stage can hear him. Mm -hmm. But 
when it, when you uh, you're like whispering, you know, off the mouth, yes. You know, you're saying it offline, but you're doing that thing, and so the audience knows they understand this is the conventions of a play. They're supposed to hear it. They know that the other people aren't supposed to hear it. All right. So that is an aside. When one character says something on stage, it is obviously audible to everyone, but it's understood that the other characters don't hear it. All right. So if you need that for your definitions, um, you can always rewind it and do this again. All right. Um, so it's the all on our side if I say, hey, you know, because this is like, no, did you put me off? No, I didn't put you off. I was just airing my middle finger out. You know, oh, no, of course I didn't do that to you. I was just pointing, you know, yeah, whatever. All right. This is typical high school stuff. All right. Do you, um, no, sir, I do not bite my thumb at you, sir. I just bite my thumb. You know, I'm just, you know, just biting it, you know, I just, you know, whatever. All right. Do you quarrel, sir? Quarrel, sir? No, sir. If you do, sir, I am for you. I serve a good as man as you. No better? Well, sir. All right. And enter Benvolio. Okay. Um, this is where I'm going to need people to supply some different parts. So uh, who wants to be Tybalt? Uh, sure. Thank you. Excellent job there. Or you can be Tybalt. All right. Um, Eliana, you're going to be Capulet. Lord Capulet. It may say Lord Capulet or Capulet in your book. Let me see what it says. Um, my text is slightly different. It says Capulet. Okay. All right. So here we go. <clears throat> so um, where were we? Okay. Say better. Here comes my master's kinsman. All right. So you don't want to seem like, all right. So you're at a, you're in the mall. It's this place where shops, where people used to gather real close to each other. I know it seems very far in the past, but you might see it again soon. All right, so anyway, you're in the mall, and you've got your Letterman jackets on, and you're walking, you're, you're, you're all tough, and in over come some moody people, all right? And you start a little bit of a, you know, you just start fighting a little bit, all right? You say a few things, you know, like, what's wrong with you, you know, yada, yada, yada. Use a little more coffee. All right. And then out of the corner of your eye, you see, I don't know, Mr. Saxton. You're like, oh, I've got to defend our honor. You know, I can't let them tell us that we're bad kids. You know, we're a, we're a horrible school. We're a bad team. Mr. Saxon's coming around. i got to impress him. All right? People back then were extremely loyal to their families, and the servants were extremely loyal to the family they served. All right? I mean, as if they are members of the family. It's their honor. They work for them. All right? Now, it's like when school spirit used to be really big in the, I don't know, 50s, 60s, 70s. I don't know what happened to us. All right? Um, or back when you used to be able to follow a – professional football team and you could really get into it because they were the guys from right down the street. But now they're the guys who get paid the most to come to your town to play. And it doesn't, I mean, it's just professional sports anywhere. All right. So here we go. Um, say better. Here comes one of our masters. Kinsman. Yes, better, sir. You lie. Draw if you be men. Gregory, remember they walk in below. All right. So everyone takes their swords out and they just start fighting. Okay. Um, well, what have you, Benvolio? No, I was, I'm going to play Benvolio. Part fools! Put up your swords. You know not what you do. Enter Tybalt. All right, so Benvolio is of the Montagues. Tybalt is of the House of Capulets. Go ahead, Tybalt. What art thou among these heartless hides? Turn thee, Benvolio, look upon thy death. All right. Okay, so Benvolio walks in, and what did he say? What's the first thing Benvolio said? Heart fools, put up your swords. You don't know, or you know not what to do. What yeah, like, break up the fight, guys. We're going to get in trouble. Stop. Tybalt walks in. The first thing he says is, um, look upon your death. Yeah, let's fight. All right. So Tybalt is the hot-headed one. Benvolio is a very relaxed, calm one. What do you call two characters that are almost polar opposites? Weren't they like foils or something? Yes. Yeah, foils, or in this case, dramatic foils. All right, so we're going to see this behavior between the two of them and how one of them just accentuates the characters of the, uh, the characteristics of the other. All right, so I do but keep the peace. Put up thy sword or manage it to part these men with me. What, or, uh, yeah, what drawn and talk of peace. I hate the word. I hate it. Yeah, at all Montagues and the, I have it, the coward. All right, and they fight. I mean, Benvo Sometimes you have no option. Benvolio has to fight Tybalt. All right. So they fight. Enter three or four citizens of the watch with clubs and partisans. 
Clogs build, partisan strike, beat them down, down with the Capulets, down with the Montagues. Lord Capulet, you run in. What noise is this? Give me my long sword, ho. All right, a crutch, a crutch. Why call you for a sword? All right, my why sword, sh- I say. Old Montague is coming to Lord's his blade in spite of mine. All right, okay, so, yeah, Lord Capulet, and it depends on how they cast this. Usually, you're an older man, all right? Obviously, Lady Capulet thinks you shouldn't have a sword. You should have what? Crutch. A crutch, a cane. You're an old man. Don't, you, you're supposed to know better. Don't join this fight with all these hot-headed teenagers. Come on. All right, then we have Montague come in. Now, Dylan Capulet! Hold on, let me go. His wife's holding him back, you know. This is, this is typical stuff. All right, Montague, Lady Montague, thou shalt not stir one foot to seek a foe. All right, so the citizens of the watch attempt to part them. Enter Prince, Prince Escalus with his train. Um, Prince, rebellious subjects, enemies to peace, profaners of his neighbor, stay and steal. Will they not hear? What ho, you men, you beasts that quench the fire of your pernicious rage with purple fountains issuing from your veins? On pain of torture, from those bloody hands, throw your mistempered weapons to the ground and hear the sentence of your moving prince. All right, so he's, he's tired of this. I'm done. All right, this is like last week when they broke up, or a few, you know, a few days ago when they broke up the drag racing in Youngstown. All right, the police had shown up a bunch of times and said, guys, you can't do this, go home. Now we're tired. You've done this again. I'm, no, we're done. All right. Three civil brawls bred of an airy word by the old Capulet and Montague have thrice disturbed the quiet of our streets and made Verona's ancient citizens cast by their grave beseeming ornaments to wield old partisans and hands as old, cankered with peace, to part your cankered hate. If ever you disturb our streets again, your lives shall pay the fourth of the peace. For this time, all the rest depart away. You, Capulet, shall go along with me. And Montague, come you this afternoon to know our father's pleasure in this case, to old Freetown, our common judgment place. Once more, on pain of death, all men depart. Okay, he's serious. Dad's upset now. All right, this is the third time. If you fight again, who's dying? You. Well, anyone, I, and it's not clear here. Is it just people who are fighting? Or is it Montague and Capulet? Yeah. All right. Um, definitely, I mean, they're, they are in charge of their households. They should be, this is like two mafia families, all right? They should be able to control their people. If they can't, then you pay the punishment for it. All right, so exit all but Montague, his wife, and Benvolio. All right, so I'm going to pay Benvolio. I need a Montague and a Lady Montague. And we don't have to, it doesn't have to be, you know, what the obvious choice here because Shakespeare, um, the interesting thing about Shakespeare plays is that, um, again, actors are not the most savory characters people thought. People like them, but then they wouldn't necessarily have them to dinner. All right. Um, and one of the things is women could not perform on stage. It was thought unseemly and inappropriate. So what happens? How do we fill these roles? He like gave men long hair. Yep. You put men in wigs and drag. All right, and hold on. She was running out of power for some reason. All right, um, so you had, you're going to have men playing women's parts and women playing men's parts, so it doesn't matter who reads what. Um, and Shakespeare played with that a lot. Some of his plays have a lot of uh, confusion of the genders, and you had, um, there's one where the woman shows up on, she's ships wrecked on shore, she's afraid to be, um, she's going to be attacked, so she dresses up like a man. She meets this guy, falls in love with him, but she's dressed up as like a guy, and so this is really awkward, and, you know, they're buddy-buddy, but she likes him, and then it's revealed, and he's like, oh, my gosh, and um, a lot of fun stuff like that. <laughs> All right, so, um, Eliana, you're Lord Montague, and, and Caleb, you're Lady Montague. All right. All right, so, Montague, go ahead. Who set this ancient quarrel new abroach? Speak, nephew. Were you by when it began? Here were the servants of your adversary and yours, close fighting ere I did approach. I drew to part them. In the instant came the fiery Tybalt with his sword prepared, which, as he breathed defiance to my ears, he swung about his head and cut the winds, whom nothing hurt withal, hissed him to scorn. While, he was, while we were interchanging thrusts and blows, came more and more and fought on part and part, till the prince came who parted either part. Oh, where is Romeo? Saw you him today. Right glad I am he was not at this fray. 
Madam, an hour before the worship sun peered forth the golden window of the east, a troubled mind drove me to walk abroad. For underneath the grove of sycamores that westward grew from the city side, so early walking did I see your son. Towards him I made, but he was aware of me and stole into the covert of a wood. I, measuring his affections by my own, which then most sought where most might not be found, being one too many by my weary self, pursued my humor, not pursuing his, and gladly shunned who gladly fled from me. All right, so a lot is being told here. Okay, so we know who Romeo is. He's the son of Lord Montague. All right, so on that sheet, you're going to, you know, fill in that basic information. All right, this is telling us a lot more. All right, so where was, when was Romeo walking? Mm. Kind of day. Like before sunrise? Yeah, almost an, was it an hour before? Worship sun. Yeah, an hour before the worship sun peaks from the east. So an hour before sunrise, Benvolio was walking because he couldn't sleep. All right? And he sees Romeo. Now, where did he see Romeo? This is important. Under the grove of sycamore trees. All right. So sycamore tree. Look at the word, sycamore. Italian students should be like having bells go off. Yeah. Sycamore. Yeah, I know. I know. I'm not sure. I'm not Ellie. I thought you took Latin, didn't you, or no? Am I just throwing that in there because I think that's the case? No. Right. It's, it's, it's because her desk is closest to the board where I write Latin based Friday on it, so I'm assuming I said just make that connection. All right. What is amore? Um, amore. I don't know. Amore isn't that like love? Yes, it's love. All right. So the sycamore tree is just a tree. All right, but in a time period, there was a lot of symbolism. People felt that a lot of things stood for other things. And if you were wandering under a grove of sycamores, you were in love. But not just sick amore, not in love, but not in love. Well, you were in love, but you were sick in love. All right, you were suffering what is called unrequited love. Unrequited love is when you like someone, they don't like you back. Or they don't even know you exist, whichever. All right, but it's unrequited. All right, so he's under a grove of sycamores, and everyone re well, reading or listening to the play would have been, oh my gosh, he's lovesick. All right, something's wrong. Okay. Now, Ben Bowie is pretty perceptive. He could tell by how Romeo was acting, and he didn't want—he wanted to be by himself. Like I'm just gonna let him go. I'll talk to him later, but I, I knew right then he wasn't gonna want to talk. All right. So, continue, Lord Montague. Many a morning hath he there been seen, with tears augmenting the fresh morning's dew, adding to clouds more clouds with deep sighs, but all so soon as the all-cheering sun. Should in the farthest east begin to draw the shady curtains from Aurora's bed, away from light stills home my heavy son, and private in his chamber pens himself, shuts up his windows, locks fair daylight out, and makes himself an artificial night. Black and portentous must this humor prove, unless good counsel may the cause remove. All right, so what's wrong with Romeo? He's depressed. <clears throat> he's what? He's depressed. Yeah, he's depressed. He suffered what back then they would have called melancholy. Um, and they felt, and there's even scientific evidence now, that you can die, when we know you can die of depression. You can be so depressed that it physically affects you. Hmm. All right. Um, and so they're worried. All right. I mean, you know, he's being a typical teenager. He's, he's going into his room, he's shutting the shutters, and he's pulling the blind down, and he's just sitting there in the darkness. Now he'd be playing like, you know, Grand Theft Auto or, you know, something like that. But back then, he's just in his room. All right. And they're worried. You know, they know that, that too much of this is a bad thing. Ben Bolio, my noble uncle, do you know the cause? I neither know it nor can learn of him. Have you importuned him by any means? Have you questioned him? But, hey, what'd you do with your day, Romeo? Nothing, Dad. All right, continue. Both by myself and many other friends, but he, his own affections counselor, is to himself, I will not say how true, but to himself so secret and so close, so far from sounding. 
and discovery, as is the bud bit with an envious worm. Ere he can spread his sweet leaves to the air and dedicate his beauty to the sun. Could we but learn from whence his sorrows grow, we would as willingly give Kier to know. All right, so they don't know. All right, and it's like I like this. This, uh, this metaphor is really good. Like like a like a bud on a flower. All right, like right now a lot of flowers are either or a lot of trees are either have flowered or the buds are just about to go. All right, um, he said it's like a bud of a flower that was bit with by some worm, but you didn't know there was anything wrong with the bud until the flower came out, or didn't. All right, so we don't know something's wrong with him. We haven't seen any outward signs. He hasn't told us. But we're concerned, nevertheless, because, you know, he could, like, before he blossoms and grows into an old man, he could die from this. So we want to make sure we nip this in the bud, as it were. See where he comes. So please, you step aside. I'll know his grievance will be much denied. I would thou wert so happy by thy stay, to hear too shrift. Come, madam, let's away. All right. And off they go. And we, just, we don't even have a break of scene here. Um, I don't know, do you have a different scene here or not? Are we still on scene one, right? I think so, yeah. Okay, all right. My text is, is different. Um, what I have in the, this is, is, is the Norton text, um, and what they've done is something really neat. Um, they have put every single version and every single edition of, every, of Romeo and Juliet that was ever put out by Shakespeare or his company all in one. Now, why are there different versions? Um, there's a lot of debate about whether Shakespeare even wrote these or who was the author of these plays because they look at the history of Shakespeare and like, well, he wasn't that educated. How could he have pulled all this off? I mean, all this wordplay, all these illusions. Um, I mean, this is amazing stuff. How could he do this? Um, whatever your feeling is, um, the, the more recent uh, conclusion people, scholars have come to is that Shakespeare, we're going to say Shakespeare wrote these plays. What we see in front of us is not what Shakespeare wrote. Um, are either of you involved in plays? In what? Plays. Have you been in a play ever? I have. Okay. All right. So what happens? You have a script in front of you, Ali, and then what happens? Is that what you act out? Well, not, not, you have to add your own character to it. Yeah. All right. So you add things in, like a character might say, I don't like this line. Let's change it. All right. Mm -hmm. So you make cuts. The director makes cuts every time a play is put forth. Um, and, and one version of Romeo and Juliet make a little bit different than the other one because they're going to change some things. All right, like again, that first that first passage between the coals and the colliers and all that, the coal jokes, and like, ah, let's just get rid of that because no one's going to get it later on. All right, um, so you cut things out, you change things, and so things are a little bit different. So the version he writes that he gives to the actors to read through is going to change a little bit, but they would have published a quarto version, a quarto. Um, so it's in reference to the size of the paper they would use. All right, paper came in larger sheets. They would fold it over once and then twice and a few more times maybe. And they'd end up with something about the size of a modern playbill, all right, which was a quarto version. But then they'd publish big folio versions of the whole sheet and they'd sell that to rich people who could afford it. Um, and so you get quarto versions, you get folio versions, you get first quarto, second quarto, and all these different versions that are out there. And what this, what Norton has done is they've put all of these together. And so I've got all the lines of all the versions of the plays here. Um, now for this play, I think most of it's in there. When you get, when you're a senior and you read Macbeth, um, there's whole scenes that are not in your book that they totally cut out. All right. Here there's just a few lines or sometimes how the lines are arranged. All right. Um, Right. We've got 10 minutes, but if you guys have nowhere to go, we'll just keep going a little bit longer um, to try to get as much of Act 1 in it as possible. All right. So, um, who wants to play Romeo? Sure. Okay, there we go. All right, you're Romeo. I'll be Ben Bolio. Ellie, you can uh, chill and take some notes or just uh, insert some questions. All right. Um, good morrow, cousin. Uh, is, that, is the day so young? But new struck nine. Uh, hey, me. S sad hours seem long. Was that my father that went hence so fast? It was. What sadness lengthens Romeo's hours? Not having that which having makes them short. In love? Out. Of love? Out of her favor where I am in love. The last that love so gentle in his view should be so tyrannous and rough and proof. Pause. All right. So, um... 
not having that which having makes them short. What makes time short? Like having fun. Having fun, or in his, this case, be in love. All right, makes time fly by. All right, isolation makes time drag. <laughs> All right, so he is not in. It's not that he's not in love. He's not in favor. He's out of her favor. All right, so he has either done something wrong. He's a guy. I mean, come on, it's gonna happen. All right, or just things aren't working out. All right, Romeo, go ahead. Alas, that love whose view is muffled still should without eyes see pathways to his will. Where shall we dine? Oh, me. Pause for a second. Do you have a stage direction there? No. All right, I've got one that says seeing blood. All right, so they're walking around and he sees the blood from the fight that just happened. All right, so the rest of these lines here are about that now. So go ahead. Okay, so do you show me to restart the thing? So this is oh, me. Start with oh, me. Oh, me, what fray was here? Yet tell me not, for I have heard it all. Here's much to do with hate, but more with love. Why then, O oh brawling love, O oh loving hate? O oh anything of nothing first created, O oh heavy lightness, serious va vanity, mishap and chaos of well-seeming forms, father of lead, bright smoke, cold fire, sick health, still walking sleep, that is not what it is. This love feel I, that that feel no love is in this. Dost thou not laugh? No, cuz. I'd rather weep. A uh, good heart at what? Thy good heart's oppression. All right, so pause for a second because we've got another term here we need to discuss. Um, they wouldn't be doing this in the play, by the way. This isn't how plays work. Well, that'd be kind of fun if it did, I guess. Although it'd be really, really, really long because they're already about two and a half to three hours long and then we stop and do this. All right, um... So uh, Romeo is upset, obviously. He's out of the favor of the woman he's in love with, whoever she is. We'll get to that later, all right? But what he's saying here, he's looking down here, is much to do with hate, but more with love. Why then, oh, brawling love, oh, loving hate. Brawling love, loving hate, what are those things? No, like the same thing. Well, okay, so you're right, but brawling love. Look at brawling love. Yeah. That doesn't sound good, does it? No. Loving hate. Loving hate. What is that? There's a word for that. And we get a bunch of them down here further. Um, heavy lightness, serious vanity, misshapen chaos of well-seeming forms, feather of lead, bright smoke, cold fire, sick health. What are all those things? How do you have sick health? Um, what is the word? Begins with an O. Oh. Uh. Give him an X, Vanna. Then a Y. What? Then an M. Oxymoron? Oh, okay. You were thinking paradox, right? Yeah, yes. Okay, all right. Okay, so an oxymoron and a paradox are both... It doesn't seem like it could be true, but it is true in a certain way, all right? That's a paradox is more of a longer phrase. An oxymoron is usually two words or a very short phrase. So feather of lead, how can you have that? How can you have a feather of lead? Because he's not what right now? He's not like happy. He's not happy. He's in love and he should be happy, but he's not. And so he's throwing out all these oxymorons to let everyone know how he feels, <laughs> okay? Um, All right, Romeo, go ahead. Why is such as love transgression? So that was oxymoron, which is a short, compressed paradox. If you want to write that down, you can always rewind it later and watch it again and see yourselves. All right? Um, it's a short, compressed paradox, usually of two words, all right, where something is said, but it's not really, it's not understood how it can be meant, but you know there's a truth to it somehow. Yeah. Um, a paradox is something like the child is the father of the man. Mm -hmm. All right, which is like, how is that possible? How can you be your own? dad and your own kid because the child comes before before you're a man you you're a child so it, it's it what you do in the, as a child affects who you are later so it, it it molds that like a parent would mold a child but in the opposite way but that's a paradox oxymoron is this compressed paradox mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Same thing, so shorter. yeah yeah it's the same thing it's just shorter 
So okay, but you're gonna need to like we I don't know well, I don't, normally you would take a test on this and you would have to know it. All right, I don't know how we're gonna work this, especially since they decided to shorten school by a week and a half or something. So um, we've got to get things done faster than well, we have to compress our paradox of a year into an oxymoron. All right, um, Romeo, go ahead. We just got I'm gonna do maybe another minute or so here. All right. Why is such we'll finish the scene off. Go ahead. Why is such is love transgression? Griefs of mine own lie heavy in my breast, with or which thou wilt propagate to have it pressed with more of thine. This love that thou hast shown doth add more grief to to too much of mine own. Love is a smoke made with the fume of sighs, being purged and a fire sparkling in lovers' eyes, being vexed, a sea nourished with loving tears. What what else is what is it else? A madness most di most discreet, a choking gal, and a perserving pers and perceiving. Perce 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 what is that? Sweet. Preserving. All my cards. Yeah. Okay. So I I. He's bad enough as, uh, on his own, and now he sees the, that there was a fight here, and he's just, it's just, just bringing him further down. Um, Doth thou add more grief to too much of mine own? You're adding more grief to my own. I don't need it anymore. Love is a smoke made with a fume of sighs. Because if you're in love, you're walking around going, because <sighs> you're in love. But yet maybe you're, you know, love's always not good. It's a hard thing. It takes a lot of work, you know. And when you're young, you're just sighing all the time. People are like, what's wrong? Nothing. All right. Um, being purged, you know, a fire sparkling in lover's eyes. So if, if those sighs result in something, that's okay. But if not, being vexed, a sea nourished with lover's tears. So then you're not even just sighing, you're crying. And you're crying so much, you're filling up the ocean. All right. What is it else? A madness most discreet. A madness most discreet. Um, a choking gall, a preserving sweet is love. Love is. And from the beginning of time, love is contradictory. You would think that everything would be great and it's amazing. It's not. It's hard work. And sometimes love sucks. All right? Um, soft, I will go along. And if you leave me, you do me wrong. Tut. <clears throat> Tut, I have lost myself. I am not here. This is not Romeo. He's some, some other where. All right. I, yeah, this is where it gets fun. I, you're not Romeo. Why are you not Romeo? I thought, you're, thought you were Romeo. What happened? How could you not be Romeo? He doesn't believe that he's like, like he doesn't believe what's going on. Well, he's not, yeah. none of us right now are ourselves. We're all a little bit off. You know, he's like, I don't feel like Romeo. I'm not Romeo. He's, he's, the, the person you think of as Romeo is not here. So don't expect to find him in other words. Right? Um, tell me in sadness, who is it that you love? What shall I groan and tell thee? Groan, why no, but sadly tell me who? Bid a sick man is sa in sadness make his will. Ah, wo word ill urged to one that is so ill. In sadness, cousin, I do love a woman. I ain't so near when I suppose you loved. A right good marksman, and she's fair, I love. A right fair mark, fair cause, as soon as hit. Well, in the... In that hit you miss, shall not be hit with Cupid's arrow, she hath Diane's wit. And in strong proof of chastity, well-armed, she will not stay the siege of loving terms, nor bid the encounter of assailing eyes, nor off her lap to saint seducing gold. Oh, she is rich in beauty, only poor, that when she dies with beauty, dies her store. All right, so this is, now we finally understand what's going on with Romeo. What's his problem? Like, I don't, like, he's trying to, like, find love, but she got hit with a Diane's hit, so, like, she's not, like, doing stuff or something like well, that. Well, okay. Um, she's not doing stuff like that. Yes, good, 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 good phrasing there. Because um, it is stuff. They're not doing stuff. What stuff does Romeo want to do? Stuff. Stop. Yes. You watch Netflix and chill. Yeah. And all she wants to do is just watch a movie. Yeah. Okay. So this is Romeo's problem. He's a typical, let's say, 
college student. We don't want to say teenager. You know, no one wants to do that stuff until they're married. All right. So anyway, anyway, whatever it is. Yes, there we go. All right. So go back a bit here because this, this, this is starting earlier. Um, when Bolio says, I aimed so near when I supposed you love. This is, there's a lot going on here. There's some puns going on here. There's some double entendres and there's some illusions happening all wrapped into one. Um, and, and most of the people would have gotten the illusions, and if they didn't, they at least got the pun. Um, so there's new more for everyone here. I aim so near when I suppose you love a right good marksman, and she's fair I love. So you're a right good marksman. You're a good shot with a bow and arrow, all right, because you hit on what, I, what the problem was. And Volio then says, a right fair mark, fair cuz, is soon as hit. All right, so... Guys, when they're talking, will sometimes use the word hit to mean a certain thing. Such as, um, I, 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 maybe the word now is tap, I believe. Yes, there you go. Okay, all right. So, you're going to hit a target with a arrow, all right? You're saying, that, you know, that, that you would hit that. The language, I mean, Shakespeare, we think we're, we're so much more evolved. We were saying this. We're saying the same things he said then, just in slightly different ways. Um, but then Romeo says, in that hit, you miss, she'll not be hit. Again, she's not, she doesn't want any of that. She doesn't want to have sex. She just wants actually to be something totally opposite. Um, when he says there, she'll not be hit with Cupid's arrow. Right? So now we're dealing with an illusion about Cupid and how Cupid shoots you with an arrow. Cupid's like... According to mythology, Cupid will shoot the lover in the eye, which sounds strange. Usually you see them getting shot in the rear end or in the heart or something. But get shot in the eye because that then makes you see the person out there and you're going to fall in love with them through your eyes. All right? But she has Diana's wit. All right? So we're another allusion to Diana, the goddess Diana, who's the goddess of? Chastity. Chastity. Yes. So she, in essence, what we've just found out from this illusion is that she wants to live in chastity her whole life. She probably just go join a nunnery or something, all right? All right. Or she just realizes what Romeo's after and doesn't want to have anything to do with it at all. It could just be that. But again, guys interpret things differently about what girls mean and the same thing about the other way, you know. Um, all right. So she will not, she wants to be, she's, she's, with strong proof of chastity, well armed. So um, she's armed with chastity. She will not stay the siege of loving terms. So he's tried to woo her with words. It hasn't worked. Nor bid the encounter of a sailing eye. He's tried to flirt with her. It hasn't worked. Nor ope her lap. Open her lap. To say seducing goals. So he's giving her gifts. Nothing. Well, because is Romeo really in love with this woman? Or is he in lust with this woman? He's in lust. Nice, yeah. Sounds like he's more in lust. I mean, he, he's got a crush on her. He doesn't really love her. She is rich in beauty, but only poor that when she dies, with beauty dies her store. And we see this argument that you'll see in, if you look at some of Shakespeare's sonnets, which I don't know if we'll have time to get to this year or not. Um, and you see in other poems, this idea that <clears throat> um, you need to use what you have or it's going to go quickly. Um, the life expectancy in, in Shakespeare's um, time was about 30 to 35 on average. And again, not that people didn't live a lot longer. Um, that's because a lot of people would have died in childbirth at a very young age. But, but life is short. And so we need to take advantage of it. It's like the idea of carpe diem sees the day. And he's saying that it'd be just such a shame if, if you died and your beauty died with you. Don't you want to, to you know, do what I want to do? And then look, you'll have kids and the beauty will live on, you know. Um, but she's not having any of that. Then she has sworn that she will still live chaste. Caleb, okay, well, that's yeah. you. Romeo, quick, we're almost done. <laughs> um, we, uh, we are. She yeah. Asked, yeah. She asked in, in that sparing, make huge ways for beauty, guard with her severity, cuts beauty off from all prosperity. She is too fair, too wise, wisely too fair. To merit bliss by making me despair, she hath for, forsworn to love, and in that vow do I live dead that live to tell it now. 
All right. So what we just said, yeah, she's like, she's cut off her beauty from all posterity. She's not just not going to do what he wants, so she's not going to have kids, and her beauty's going to die with her, and you're upset. All right, be ruled by me. Forget to think of her. This is good friend advice. You know, there's other fish in the sea. Go ahead. Oh, teach me how I should forget to think. By giving liberty under thine eyes, examine other beauties. It, tis the way to call hers e exquisite in question more. These happy masks that kiss far lady's brow, that being black puts us in mind they had they hide the fair. That he that is struck and blind cannot forget the precious treasures of his eyesight lost. Show me a mistress that is passing fair. What what doth her beauty serve but as a note? Where I may read who passed that who passed that passing fair, farewell, the thou canst not teach me to forget. I'll pay that doctor or else die in debt. All right, so Romeo, you're saying all I'm going to do if I see a beautiful woman is think that she's not as beautiful as this other woman I love, which we don't even know her name yet. So again, is he really in love with her? I don't know. All right. Um, but Benvolio is convinced he can find someone else for her. But Romeo was like, no, no, no. She's the best one for me. No one else is going to, there's no one else that loves me. No one understands me, dad. All right. Um, it's not a phase. All right. So it's just typical, just typical, I don't know, young love, teenage stuff, no one understands me, she's the only one for me, he's the only one for me, whatever, all right? Okay, so we're going to end there with Act 1, Scene 1, and then you're going to read Act 2, Scene, or Act 1, Scene 2, um, 3, 4, 5, my gosh, I mean, um, on your own. Now, what I might do, um, I might... I'd like people to read it first and then we'll watch it. So don't try to go out and find a version because again, thing, they cut things out. So you need to read through this. Um, I may, if I've got time this week and I'm swamped getting uh, senior essays done, um, I might do a Zoom video of me just reading the rest of it. Um, I might just post online a reading of it um, so you can get the feel of how the words sound um, because that is sometimes a problem. You're, you're, you're tripping your tongue over a lot of what he's written here because one, the language is a bit archaic for us. Two, it's written in iambic pentameter. All right, so take your notes out one last time. Iambic pentameter um, means that there are 10 syllables in a line for five iams, an I-A-M-B. An iamb is a metrical foot um, consisting of an unstressed and a stressed syllable. So one unstressed, one stressed, like you would just, you know, you naturally just stress words when you say them, and if you do them differently, it sounds odd, all right? So um, the iambic pentameter, that rhythm, that one, two, one, two, one, two, um, Shakespeare, we feel Shakespeare chose that because it most closely mirrors the beating of a human heart, which is a natural rhythm for people. All right, now, are there always 10 syllables in each line? No, all right? Um, Oftentimes, though, um, we're also dealing with not just syllables, but also rhyming lines. Um, and we'll talk about that in the next Zoom meeting. Okay? Any questions? I do. I have questions. Yes, go ahead. So I read it beforehand, and I was looking at the quiz thingy we had to do. Mm -hmm. And I had some questions about that. Okay. All right. Well, um, do you want to cut the video off and just answer those questions, or should we, should we let everyone else get the answers to those questions? What do you think? That's up to you. Oh, I don't know. I lost my daughter. What do you think? Should I, the people who haven't read it yet, should I give them the answers beforehand by having them, or, or if they even watch this, that's another thing. Let's do the questions and answers, and then if they watch it, they'll benefit from it. But if they're lazy, they just won't get it. So go ahead. Uh, what were some of those questions? Okay, so um, they talk, one of the questions talks about soon to married. And one yeah. of the answers says brides and mothers, but the texts talk about girls who marry too early grow up too fast. So I was like, which one is it? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I believe it's a reference to Lord Capulet's line. Um, and there's, again, that's why it's really cool to watch this because there's one version, the Zeffirelli version, if you can look it up online, it'll be on YouTube. Uh, it's the really grand one where uh, the fight in the beginning takes 15 minutes, 
Uh, I mean, it's 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 on a large scope. They they taken over this whole town in Italy, and we're just you know they're filming everywhere. Um, but in that one, you have Lord Capulet talking about you know oh no we don't want to have you know girls that are too young we don't want to get married young because that can go wrong. And in the film, he glances over and you see Lady Capulet on the other side of the the the, the piazza and the, the, the little like an AD or an atrium in their house little plaza in the middle, um, and she glances at him and gives him a dirty look and closes the window. And you get the feeling that their marriage isn't that good, possibly because she got married too soon. And again, this is still a day and an age where marriage is not a love proposition. It's a business arrangement. Um, women need security. A father wants to marry his daughters off to gain title or to gain land or, you know, to ensure that his grandchildren are well off, not necessarily because they're all in love. Uh, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Anything else? There's kind of like a, tr I think it's a trick question. When mm -hmm. um, the question asks if Par when is Paris going to try to marry Juliet, it says either two summers or when she's 15. Isn't she going to be 15 in two summers? She is, yes, yeah, it's the same thing, yeah, she's, when we meet her, she's just, I think she's 13, she'll be 14 shortly, but yeah, when two summers have gone by, we want to wait till she's 15 before she gets married, Lord Captain, that's okay. about the right time. Yeah, I think they're just putting forth a bill in, in, uh, in, in Pennsylvania so that we don't have any more child brides, I think it's not illegal there yet to get married before you're a certain age, let's not do that, yeah, all right, anything else? Okay. All right. Good. All right. So um, we will sign off then and I'll see you guys again. I might do another one later in the week, I, I, but I'm trying to get papers graded and this, this is rough. Um, but if, if anyone needs anything, email, ask any questions um, and we can go over any of these questions you need to. Um, read through the play once and if you want to then find, again, the Zeffirelli version, Z-E-F-F-E-R-I-L-L-I. -L -L -I. There's a bunch of Z's and F's and R's. Look up Zeffirelli. And you'll find it online, um, probably, and you can probably act, watch Act One. Um, and then I will post the version I have, which was, again, in, it was, that's the one I saw. I was in, in, in London, in England, how many years ago was that, dear? 10, now 11 years ago. It's not going to travel anytime soon either. Um, but anyway, I was there. And we happened to just, like, they were playing Romeo and Juliet, and we got tickets, um, just called up, and they had tickets available, and we got tickets, and we were actually in the pit on the edge of the stage watching the exact production that I will put up for you once we're at least through act two, possibly. I'm going to post at least one and two next week and you can see that and um, you can watch different versions, but sometimes when you watch all the one version, you, you can recognize characters and whatnot. But if you watch too many different versions, you're going to get confused. So, all right, um, signing off. Have a wonderful day, week, and we'll see you again.